All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BX Just Weekly, episode 46, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, we're definitely back on track in 2018 with all the news releases and libraries and demos because this episode is going to be pretty damn large. So let's get started without uh, more talk. Right. Um, yeah. Before we get into this uh, tiny announcement, so if you are watching this live, um, this is now going to be the typical time for it, 2 p.m. Uh, Berlin time or uh, 2 p.m. set Central European time, right? This is what I'm going to be doing from now on because it just leaves the evening for movies or whatever, you know, so it just works better for me. So here we go. But okay, uh, going back to the articles, let us start with the first one. That is titled creating of neural network using JavaScript in seven minutes. And this is a pretty good tutorial on how to write your own very simple two layer neural network using pure JavaScript and well, math JS for you know, mathematical stuff. Um, the article itself does explain how the uh, neural networks work, but it does assume that you have a pretty deep knowledge of the mathematic and you know, mathematical notation and all that kind of stuff. There is an embedded video in here uh, from the um, I'm, I'm always forgetting the name of the channel was it three brown one blue, three blue one brown, there we go, um, which is possibly uh, if, you, if you had never heard about this channel, this is possibly the best channel about mathematical topics you will ever find on the internet. And um, so there is an amazing course on deep learning and neural networks. And if you are confused about them, just watch the videos, you will get it 100%. The article itself is also pretty good. But you know, again, mathematical notation and some uh, background mathematical knowledge is actually required to understand majority of stuff in here. Nonetheless, a really cool um, tutorial on how to create your own neural network. So yeah, if you are curious, do check it out. Uh, hey, Madaputra, welcome to the stream works better for you. That's that's awesome. So I, I'm hoping more people would be able to watch it as well. That would be great. All right, next article we got here is defensive JavaScript on how to write code that doesn't do what it's on. Oh, well, I, I, I'm not sure how to read that word. It's like on, right? On? I don't know, which it shouldn't do. Let's just put it this way. So it talks about exactly defensive JavaScript, right? So how do you actually think about code in a defensive way as in, you know, so we have this function that constructs a string using two parameters, like a link text and a URL, and it just returns an ahref link and then the text in the HTML uh, tag, right? So what can go wrong? And then there is basically the whole article is talking about what in this specific case can go wrong and how you can think about the code in the same way when you write different things, right? So there's possibilities of XSS, possibilities of script injections, and so on and so forth, possibility of data breaking and other things. So uh, if you're curious about defensive JavaScript, this is a really good introduction to it. And we'll probably get you started in no time. If you already know how you know how to think about the code in a way that make sure that the parameters are valid, make sure they're actually sanitized and everything, then well, you don't really find uh, anything new in this article, but it is a very good introduction. Right, next one we got here is the Flexbox Holy Albatross, which is the silliest name ever, but the article is actually great. Uh, so it talks about solving a problem of when you have a number of uh, columns, right, the items that are sorted in column on a large screen, which you want to represent as a rose on a small screen, like on a mobile or on a limited space in a browser or something like this, right. And how do you actually solve this? So there's obviously a bunch of ways it starts going, okay, so you can use media queries, which kind of work, but only, you know, in a wide viewport or narrow viewport, if you actually narrow the context, it won't change anything, right? Because the media, like media query will still stay the same because the screen doesn't change. And then, okay, okay, there's a JavaScript solution, which means we can just use the resize observer or something like this, and then code that to change the CSS, which is like, okay, ish but still not as nice. And then there is Flexbox, which apparently can do this in a very simple way. Um, hey, Renato, welcome to the stream. So yeah, there is a solution here for the uh, Flexbox. Uh, and there's a follow up post that makes it even simpler, which is really, really cool. 
So if you're curious about the Flexbox and doing the responsive uh, websites using Flexbox, then definitely check out those two posts because they are really, really good. Right, next article we got here today is Adonis JS, or is it Adonis or Adonis? Uh, I think it's, I think it's Adonis, right? Adonis JS, a full featured node framework for modern web browsers. So yeah, it's a tutorial for Adonis JS, which is sort of the all in one framework, similar to PHP Laravel, as it says here, I think it was inspired by it. And uh, basically a very object oriented framework, but it does have everything you want to have uh, in a framework, you know, you're going to use to build a website, there is model view controller, all that kind of stuff. As I already said numerous times, I'm not a huge fan of object oriented programming, I don't think I would ever want to go back to PHP way of doing things. Although there were some really nice frameworks as well. But majority of them, you know, like at least the ones I, I used at the time was like very heavy MVC stuff. And it was a pain in ass. So I do prefer Express.js and, um, you know, more functional, easy approach, but it actually seems like a very mature and very nice framework. Ah, Amanda Putra, you're using Adonis. So what do you think about it? Let us know in the chat if you like it or not, actually. It's yeah, it seems to be relatively popular. So if you wanted to get into the whole uh, Adonis JS uh, hype train, I guess, this article will get you started in no time. It basically has overview of all the basic features that you need to know to start the website. All right, uh, the next article we got today is the new ES 2018 features every JavaScript developer should know. It's a very nice summary of the new JavaScript features released in the last year that are I think majority of them are actually already shipped in the browsers and Node.js. So it's a really good point uh, to learn them if you still haven't. Um, the features are, you know, I guess majority of you guys already know about this, but there you go. So there's a rest spread, obviously, which is immensely useful. And I've been using it since it's appeared in Babel.js from the day one, basically, because this is just awesome. Um, there is a synchronous iteration, which I have actually not used yet, but I can see how it can be immensely useful for working with essentially asynchronous objects, right? Like the queries or cursors and stuff like this. There is uh, what else is there the promise dot finally, of course, again, I haven't used that yet, because I didn't really need it anywhere. But again, it's quite useful. Uh, on the other hand, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm writing a sync await code now. So I get finally anyways, so it's like, I don't know if I need that. But whatever. There's new regular expression features, uh, probably the coolest one is look behind assertions, finally, uh, as well as dot all flags and named capture groups, which was um, the most annoying bit switching from something like PHP or Perl, you know, where you actually had them. And then you go to JavaScript, and you're like, Okay, so how do I name this? And well, you can't, right, you're gonna suffer. Well, now you can actually name them and you get them as the proper uh, match groups as an object. So instead of, you know, thinking, okay, so how do I calculate this is the first match, the second match, and so on and so forth, which is pretty handy. And uh, I think that is actually it, right? I oh, know there's a template literal revision minor changes to them. Uh, but yeah, if you are, um, if you still don't know some of those features, or maybe all of them, then do check it out. This is a very good summary and introduction to the new uh, ES 2018 features. Next article we got here is an informal exploration of structural sharing proxies and copy and write semantics. Um, this is a very interesting article that talks about re implementing, uh, or I guess programming. So let me just quote this programming in a Lisp like recursive style, but using JavaScript arrays, right? So we just take the way that Lisp works with objects or sorry, arrays and lists, right? Uh, and you try to implement this in JavaScript. And it actually is absolutely fascinating. I mean, this is not something you would want to do and do in production and stuff like this. Because, well, it's not Lisp, right? And writing stuff like this is not very um, handy. But yeah, it's like, uh, it's a really cool exercise that shows you what you can actually do. And furthermore, first, it starts with basic functions, and then goes to uh, re implement the features using proxies, which is absolutely fascinating. So if you're curious about this sort of mental exercise, I guess, and maybe even a bit of coding exercise, right? So because there is not that much code in here, but the whole um, thought process and the whole idea is really, really cool. 
if you ever were curious about the Lisp and the way it works with um, um, lists, because I mean, L Lisp stands for the lists programming, right? Uh, or Lisp programming language or something along those lines, but it is really, really awesome. And it's pretty interesting to see all of that in JavaScript. So uh, quite highly recommend it. All right, let me see the chat. I kind of like Express Fastify, Adonis makes like PHP, but yeah, the speed are good for MVC. Uh, okay, so, so it's basically very MVC, but quite solid framework. Cool, thank you for sharing this. Uh, where do you find all those articles? Well, Reddit, Twitter, news, emails, whatever. I follow a lot of people from JavaScript scene mostly. This is, and you know, they share this stuff. So this is like 90% of where I get the info from basically. Um, yeah, I guess it will be like 70% Twitter, 20% Reddit, and 10% from uh, weekly mailing lists and stuff like this, you know. All right, continuing. The next article we got here is the common API mistakes and how to avoid them. So this is, um, yeah, it's, it's talking about your typical mistakes that you can do while building your own APIs, endpoints, and uh, predominantly actually talks about the REST here, right? So it's, I would say REST APIs, right? Uh, because if you take something like GraphQL, you no longer have half of those problems. But nonetheless, if you are new to building REST APIs and you are um, sort of looking for the best practices or you know things that can go wrong, the data structures that can uh, hinder your development and so on and so forth, then do check it out. There is some really good pointers in there, but again, I wouldn't take them as you know 100% correct because there are cases when you don't really want to follow some of those things. But again, you know, there's no silver bullet solution for writing absolutely great APIs. Uh, still, quite a good read, so quite recommend it. All right, next article we got here is JavaScript modules from uh, IIFEs to CommonJS to ES6 modules. I would call this article the history of JavaScript modules, essentially, um, as well as tutorial to all of them, basically. And just as the title says, it walks you through the JavaScript ecosystem evolution and how the people used to write modules, uh, modules, modules using immediately invoked functions, and then you know going forward to the common JS, which was introduced in Node.js, and going forward to the ES6 modules uh, that were introduced in the latest, uh, what was it, ES6 2015, I think, right? And how do you actually use them and write them and what are the um, underlying uh, things that are related to that? There is basically a lot of depth in here. And if you are still confused about some parts of the modules, or maybe you wanna learn the history because you, you, know, you just got into JavaScript now and just using ES6 modules, then do check it out. There is some really good stuff in here. All right, next article we got here is interactive text animation with React hooks. This is a tutorial on how to make a fancy animation like the one you see on screen. It's basically a text, header text with changing colors depending on your mouse position using React and the React hooks that are still unreleased by the way, but should be coming really, really soon. Uh, we will talk about that a bit later in the podcast. But yeah, if you wanted to uh, do a nice animation uh, using CSS essentially in this case and React hooks, which um, I mean, again, you know, it's a, essentially one hook that just taps into the mouse position. And um, I think, yeah, it's it's a very basic tutorial, but it does show you at least the very basic usage of mouse position with hooks, and then how to, to apply that to the specific animations. What I would do uh, in case of author, because they, I mean, it's one component, right? But the cool thing is here is that you can actually use those hooks and extract them into a separate use mouse hook, which would be even better. But uh, I guess, you know, that's, that's a, I guess, an extension of the article more than that, but... It's uh, quite neat nonetheless. So if you want to learn animation based on React hooks, do check it out. Next article we got here is creating a node gRPC service using Mali. So this is a tutorial, pretty extensive one uh, on the gRPC uh, in Node.js using uh, gRPC official library and Mali framework that allows you to create gRPC microservices. Um, I honestly never used gRPC, so I can't really comment much about that. I know that this is a thing that exists. It's a, basically a protocol baked in, in a, inside of Google, right? I think gRPC is literally like Google RPC. I might be wrong about that, but that's what I always thought. 
And this essentially walks you through setting up your own gRPC service, right? So you will have to write the message formats and everything and then use Mali to actually create service based on top of your gRPC structure, which is kind of neat. Um, I honestly never needed to use RPC anywhere for uh, at least the one, you know, the projects that I worked on. It always came down to, okay, the rest is enough, but maybe you have a case where you actually want to have RPC and you want to try gRPC, then this tutorial is basically everything you need to get started. All right. Next article we got here is handling time zones in JavaScript. Um, yeah, this is more painful articles about working with dates and times in JavaScript. And uh, it is very in depth. So it starts by talking what are the time zones? Uh, what, you know, why do they exist? How do they work? Time zones are not just offsets and stuff like this. And then how do you actually convert that into the code, right? How do you handle the time zone changes and time zone differences in JavaScript to actually show the time to the user that is actually relevant to the specific user viewing your page, right? Uh, and how do you save it in database when the user creates time on a client, uh, considering the time zone and stuff like this. Uh, we have the same problem on the BXGS website. We um, kind of, uh, for now, I just hard coded the burden time, but we are going to write a widget that would essentially convert it to the viewer's time. And I still dread this moment because after reading this article, I am even more terrified of this stuff because it is not easy. So, um, you know, if you're planning to work with a time or dates in JavaScript, or if you have a specific problem with time zones, do check it out. This is a really good write up. Next article we got here is using Docker for Node.js in development and production. This is a tutorial on how to package your Node.js apps into Docker and then run it locally or remotely in production, uh, you know, on your server, for example. It's a pretty good write up. There is basically all you have to know, including the Docker Compose deployment and uh, for localhost and then running the Kubernetes. I don't think it actually has the Kubernetes part in the tutorial itself, but the author said they are using Kubernetes for deployments because uh, this is what you typically do. You almost never deploy with Docker Compose to the production, right? Nonetheless, pretty good write up. Um, read the comments. There is also a lot of interesting stuff in there. So if you are getting into Docker and Node just now, then this is a pretty good start. If you already know all of that, well, you won't really find anything new here. All right. Next article we got is mscripten and npm. This is a tutorial from uh, Google Web Guys that shows how to set up a project that uses existing C++ code base and uh, allows you to work with it on the web. I think uh, this is basically a follow up on how they did this squoosh app, which is a really neat uh, image processing uh, online tool, basically. And uh, the interesting bit is they actually don't install mscript and locally, but they use it as a Docker image, which is, uh, I guess, you know, I've been doing this since Docker was released, I guess, but I've been seeing more and more people instead of installing the dependencies locally, just run a Docker container that have everything prepared because it's just convenient, right? You just install one Docker and then you can run LaTeX, you can run mscripten, you can run whatever the hell you want without actually installing the thing. And if you no longer need it, you just remove the image and you get your space back, which is just awesome. So yeah, uh, if you're curious about how to uh, compile C++ project to WebAssembly and then use it in your Node project, then this tutorial basically got you covered and uh, shows all the steps that you need to take, including the make files and everything. I am very far away from C++ world. So um, yeah, I guess, you know, I can't really comment on any of that. But since it's from the Google guys, I, I guess it's a really good one. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is adding tracing with Jaeger to an Express application. Uh, so Jaeger is um, open source end to end distributed tracing framework from the Uber development team. It's Yes, open source, it's available for free. You can just download, install it and use it. The idea of tracing uh, frameworks or services is that you can uh, take your server and send the traces of specific things happening to that tracing server and then later analyze it with some sort of a dashboard, right? So instead of, um, this is typically helpful in uh, large scale real time systems. If you have something small that, you know, it doesn't really matter all that much, but if you have a lot of complex uh, microservices that are working together, it can be very hard to figure out where the hell stuff breaks. 
and tracing frameworks actually help with that quite a bit. So this talks about uh, adding Jaeger uh, to the Express app, quite basic. Uh, there is, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a very basic tutorial essentially. Uh, you're also gonna be writing the Jaeger as a, a node, um, sorry, Docker uh, image, Docker container. And yeah, then you will just send traces from your Express app into the Jaeger and then inspect them uh, in a very simple way. So. If you're curious, you know, if you're working with microservices, you already pro probably know about the tracing frameworks. Uh, if not, then well, it's a good time to start learning. If you haven't worked with that, or you know, you're exploring the logging things, um, opportunities to do the cloud logging, maybe aggregation from multiple services, then do check it out. This might be the things you're looking for. And yeah, it's not the only one, obviously. There's like a bunch of other things like Elk Stack and uh, Grafana with their products. Like they have the, I think they, they changed from just being a dashboard for performance to being like a bunch of services for basically uh, logging, tracing and, and just about everything else, which is kind of, uh, kind of great. Uh, looks like Jaeger looks like Zipkin. I think the Zipkin was actually mentioned here in the beginning. Yeah, there you go. So there's Zipkin, Open Tracing, and Jaeger. Uh, obviously, you can use any of them, but this is just a tutorial for Jaeger. So, you know, if you're using one of those, you'll probably know exactly what this is going to be about. So, there you go. All right. Continuing, we got what if we could verify NPM packages? So, this is a continuation of a discussion of the NPM security, you know, the state of NPM security the whole uh, thing with uh, people injecting malicious code into dependencies or the packages themselves and stuff like this. And how can we actually uh, try to, well, at least make it a bit harder to uh, make the package malicious, right? So uh, the author actually goes uh, first to discuss that, you know, NPM is actually a few attack vectors and they are not actually security flaws because a lot of package managers work this way, right? And this is not a security flaw, it's just an attack vector. And uh, then it goes, okay, so what is the solution? The solution should be that uh, you can take the package on NPM, right? you can get the git head from the package and you can, you get the SHA sum that is automatically calculated on publish. The idea is that if you pull that git head and if you do the new build for the um, NPM, I think there's the NPM, what was it? NPM pack dry run, right? There you go. So you can dry run the uh, packaging that which will tell you that, okay, so I'm gonna package all of that stuff and here's your SHA uh, sum, right? The idea is that if you do this dry, dry run, you should get exactly the same SHA sum as the one in NPM, which would mean that your package is correct and you know it's not compromised and nothing is injected in there, which is, I guess, a good start, right? Um, so there's even a proof of concept package validator here called Trust But Verify that you can try and it verifies correctly stuff like Redux and Express but it doesn't work on all the packages because some of them don't have the prepack step that does all the required things before the publish, right? For example, the Lodash, which is quite popular, as you might know, doesn't pass this test because, well, I guess some things are packaged that shouldn't be in there or something like this. They probably have a completely separate release uh, pipeline, which makes it a bit more uh, complicated, you know, to do something like this. But it's a really cool exercise and it's a really cool uh, idea and I would actually love to see that integrated into the NPM itself because you know having third-party tools is nice and everything but I feel like this should be in the NPM itself and NPM should warn you when the SHAs don't really fit. I don't think it should be like a hard failure especially if we add it dynamically like for example you know if we take Lodash it, it fails now right so the SHA sounds don't match because they have different build steps but it should at least tell you that, hey, you know, maybe you should look at this package because there is some problems. And then once we have this actually in NPM, the package maintainers will gradually migrate to this new system and actually all the packages should become green, which is kind of great. So yeah, a nice idea. If you're interested in more details to check out the article, it is pretty cool. Next article we got here is why I don't use React Router. So uh, this is, as uh, I believe it was in, in on Twitter, someone said it's like one man's beef with the React router. Was it in a mailing list? I don't remember, honestly, but that's a very good summary of um, 
the complaints about the, you know, so he has a very specific set of complaints that he doesn't like about the React router, uh, which I, in my opinion is actually a really good library and has a lot of uh, positive sides, but as well a lot of sort of uh, trade-offs. I would I would not put this as, you know, a negatives, but I would say this is a trade-offs. Like there's a bunch of ways of doing things and you cannot address all the use cases as always, right? So it does some things very good and other things, well, not so much. But there's a lot of uh, things that the author complains here about. Uh, what I found interesting is that he doesn't addresses those complaints yet. He does say that he's building his own routing solution, which would sort of fix all of that. So I'm kind of curious to see how exactly he will fix all of that. Because first of all, I'm all in for, you know, better, newer, fancier routing solutions. Although, you know, React Router worked quite well for me so far. But if his solution is better, I'm all up for that. But uh, this article, unfortunately, doesn't really give any answers. It just says, hey, you know, it's actually here's, here's the bad things. Here's what I don't like, but um, I won't tell you how to fix that. But I guess, you know, we'll, we'll wait for the next article from the author and see what exactly he offers with his own uh, thing. Uh, okay, next article we got here is porting 30,000 lines of code from flow to TypeScript. This is um, essentially a story of how the MemSQL Studio was ported from uh, flow type to script because flow type seems to be dying and there's gonna be a bit more proof down the line today in a podcast. Everyone seems to be jumping ship to the TypeScript essentially. And this is a write up of how they rewritten a pretty large code base to TypeScript and what kind of challenges did they had while doing that, which is actually, I mean, not that much to be honest. Um, some of them were absolutely expected because you know, flow is very different from TypeScript. But it is a really cool write-up. So if you are using Flow and if you are considering jumping ship to TypeScript as well, do check out this article. It will give you a pretty good understanding of what issues you will encounter along the way. Which is, I mean, you know, it's it's I it looks like it's totally worth it actually. So there you go. All right, next article we got here is why I've stopped exporting defaults from my JavaScript modules. And it talks about um yeah, exactly why it is a better idea to export named exports instead of a default export from your files, which I mean, I, I, I personally like I get the I get the point, right? So the point is that if you import default imports, right, you will always have to call the thing yourself, right? So you will have to name it yourself. And it's going to be up to you to name it whatever the hell you want. And if you export a named export, it's always going to be named by the author essentially who wrote that module and it's gonna be very easy to um, include or essentially and reuse, right? So you're gonna have consistency across the documentation and stuff like this. I get it, but I honestly think this is like overkill. Maybe for some code bases it's okay, but I don't know. It's it's a very personal thing obviously, but I'm not not convinced that I should do this all the time, right? So it's like, <laughs> I guess it makes some sense, but I'm not sure. So if you're curious, do uh, check out the article there's some valid points in here, but uh, again, take it with a grain of salt. What do I think about TypeScript? I think TypeScript is great, but I never, like I've used it a bunch of times, but I don't know, I, it just doesn't, didn't really stick to me, let's put it this way. I always feel like the types are a burden to me more than a bun, you know? So if, if, it, if it would be a boon, then I, um, I would wholeheartedly take it and use it because if it gives me more safety, that's great. But I, all the time, every time I tried to use TypeScript, there always was some sort of a problem, either with tools or with ecosystem or with packages that just broke the project for me. And I was suffering, you know, trying to fix that instead of doing productive work. So I, maybe I'm just using it wrong, but I don't know. Just, uh, I really like the idea and I really like the TypeScript itself. I think there's have some, a lot of really cool ideas, but, I don't know, man. Like, I, maybe it's just not my thing. <laughs> okay. Next article we got here is the tech choices I regret at Spectrum. It's a write-up from the uh, Max uh, Stoiber, who is a co-founder of Spectrum, which is an open-source chat slash community app uh, that was recently acquired by GitHub. And uh, he's talking about yeah the, the technology choices that was done in the very beginning of the you know creating the project. 
and why he regrets them. So there is a lot of very interesting thoughts in here, like for example, not using React Native Web, which is not a thing that I thought I would ever see in a regrets. Or not using Next.js. I mean, I can't imagine this as a regret because I don't think I could write any other uh, React website using not using Next.js. I mean, maybe maybe Parcel. But yeah, uh, using RethinkDB. I, I actually uh, stepped on the same uh, problem uh, at one point a few years ago when the RethinkDB was still a company. And we tried to build a project. They had the change feeds, which worked really well. The problem was that because everything DB is so niche, there was a very tiny community. It was damn hard to find any solution to a problem. Because you know, if you're using MongoDB, you can literally just Google something and there will be some sort of a solution somewhere on the internet, essentially, right? Well, everything DB is way more niche and it's way harder to actually figure out what the hell's going on. There is, yeah, there's also like editor picks, like draft.js uh, is a regret apparently, and there's a bunch of takeaways. So if you're curious about the overall, you know, technical product design, check it out. There are some really interesting thoughts here. All right, next thing we got here is uh, GoDaddy is sneakingly injecting JavaScript into your website and how to stop it. If you're still hosting at GoDaddy, I don't know why I just stop doing that. This is the, it's literally the shittiest domain provider ever. And this is not the first story of them doing bullshit. So now they decided that it's okay to inject JavaScript into the uh, domains that they uh, own essentially, right? So they, they rent to you, I guess. And um, yeah, you can stop it. You have to opt out specifically, which is again, bullshit. So if you're using GoDaddy, you can opt out right now and then you know start migrating to a better platform. And if you're curious as to what this script does, there is another article called Reverse Engineering GoDaddy's Tracking Script. And it does a very nice um, sort of description of how the author dissected the script and figured out what exactly it does and what it sends to the uh, GoDaddy. And there is a lot of data that is getting sent about your users. And all of that is received by GoDaddy for unknown reason. I'm pretty sure this is via this GDPR in Europe, uh, but yeah, this is, <laughs> if you're using GoDaddy, just, just don't. So this is it for the articles. Now we are coming to the more uh, short sized things and um, you know, tiny bit awesomeness. The first thing we got here is the future of TypeScript on ESLint and uh, TypeScript team along with ESLint team just announced a project called TypeScript ESLint and it is basically going to be ESLint is going to support TypeScript natively at one point once this is basically finished, which is awesome because as I said, you know, TypeScript and tooling is always at least was always very, very fiddly to set up. So maybe in a few years, we can just write TypeScript as we write JavaScript. And then I guess at this point, I will probably just switch as well. So there you go. Next thing we got here is be strict without TypeScript. Uh, and it's actually kind of without TypeScript, but you still need the TypeScript installed. So if you didn't know, if you're using VS Code, VS Code can actually enable TypeScript validation in your JavaScript, uh, which will utilize the JS doc uh, annotations to make sure that your parameters and return values are right, right? So if you describe a function using JS doc and you say that params should be a number and this param should be a string, the TypeScript will actually validate that and show you an errors in the VS code saying, hey, this is actually not quite correct, which is pretty great start actually. So, you know, if you want a bit more type safety, do check this out and maybe enable it in your VS code and uh, use it. Next article we got here is how to navigate the maze of JavaScript code. And it's essentially an introduction. Let me try that again. An introduction to a tool uh, called Code Crumbs that visualizes your uh, code base and your traversal essentially through that code base using this sort of a uh, file slash folder tree where you can um, you know navigate and jump through function to function and you will see your path, which I, I don't know how useful that will be for me. I tend to keep my code base as simple as possible because I know when I come back to that code base, two weeks later, I won't remember a thing. And the simpler it is, the faster I will figure out what the hell's going on, right? 
So I don't know, but maybe that's useful for you. So do check it out. It seems to be very slick and very nice. It is available on uh, GitHub. So you can just grab it and check it out yourself. Next thing we got here is the news from NPM Tink. Uh, it now supports VASM imports and you can actually just uh, now write TypeScript, import the WebAssembly module into it and just use it, which, which is kind of awesome. So once again, you know, once NPM Tink is out, once TypeScript ESLint is out, we're gonna have a TypeScript essentially baked in into the JavaScript ecosystem, which is kind of great. So there you go. Next thing we got here is the migration of Jest to TypeScript. This is why I was saying that FlowScript is kind of slowly fading away basically because the Facebook team, right? So the Jest is maintained by the Facebook, the same guys who brought you Flow, is migrating Jest from Flow to TypeScript. So I feel like they are soon, at least, you know, maybe not now, but in the next months or maybe a year, Facebook team is probably going to announce that flow is getting discontinued because majority of projects just use TypeScript right now, which is kind of cool. So I guess that's, that's all for the best, you know, but it's pretty interesting to see uh, the whole migration anyway. And there's a lot of discussion going on, by the way, if you are curious as to what pros and cons would migrate into TypeScript bring to the project uh, as big as Jest. So if you're curious to check it out, it's a really cool discussion. Next thing we got here is, uh, did you know there is a screencast mode in Visual Studio Code? Uh, I did not know about it, but it is kind of cool and it adds this overlay which shows what keys you press, which is kind of awesome, I guess. Um, I don't think I would use that in a normal, you know, streams or whatever, but if you are creating a screencast or a GIF of something and you wanna showcase what keys you press aside from, you know, typing on the screen, obviously, this is kind of neat that it's basically baked into the VS code itself. So there you go. Next thing we got here is 15 underrated VS code themes for change in 2018. Just as the title says, it's a nice collection of VS code themes. Uh, there is a Slack team, which is actually no longer Slack theme uh, because Slack just changed their design, but you know, whatever. But yeah, there's a collection of 15 themes that actually look quite nice. Some of them look pretty sleek, but I think I still stick with my One Dark Pro theme, which is just my absolute favorites. And uh, yeah, other than that, you know, uh, just check it out. Maybe you'll find a theme that you like. Next thing we got here is implementing picture in picture on the web. This is a tutorial on how to use picture in picture programmatically uh, on the web. If you didn't know the picture in picture landed in, I think it was in a lot, one of the latest Chromes. And now if you open any HTML5 video, you can actually right click it and uh, say picture in picture and get a floating window of it that you can drag around and watch wherever the hell you want, which is quite nice. Apparently the same feature is available programmatically, so you can just use JavaScript to do the same. And this is essentially what this tiny tutorial tells you about. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is a small today I learned uh, that Chrome DevTools will help you pick accessible color schemes. I did not know about this feature, but this is kind of awesome. So there's the color picker in the DevTools actually shows you accessibility uh, Values, I'm not even sure what you call those, but um, yeah, essentially it has, you know, a special system that tells you, so you should pick the colors in this area, and then they will be way more accessible for the users, which is awesome. So if you are working a lot with accessibility, do check this out, it's a really cool tip. Right, uh, next awesome thing we got here is the news from NPM team. Uh, NPM now automatically uh, revokes tokens that you accidentally publish. So we'll actually monitor packages and figure out you know, that this is a compromised token and we will be um, automatically revoked and will stop working, which is a great step towards better security. So there you go. Um, next cool thing we got here is another uh, recipe actually from React Hooks FAQ, which I somehow missed, but I think it's a really cool pattern. The idea is that you can use, you can use reducer at very top of your uh, app, for example, or very top of the components that should change the state using reducer, right? Get this dispatch function. But this dispatch function will be, um, so you will you will have to somehow pass it to all the children, right? Which might be annoying, using props is pain in ass. So what you do, you just create a dispatcher, um, sorry, the context, 
uh, which has the value of the dispatch function. And whenever you need to use it, you just use use context hook with a to do dispatch uh, context. And you get this dispatch function that can be called from anywhere in the subtree, which is absolutely awesome and essentially means that you don't need Redux in most of cases right now, you know, when you have simple cases like this, which is great. And uh, next thing we got here is the uh, opinion uh, from Dan Abramov on uh, test-driven development. He says, test-driven development paralyzes me. I'm all for writing tests early in the process, especially in the library code but I can't write them before I play. I need to write a shitty draft and play with the behavior to understand what I really want, then rewrite guided by test. This is very close to the way I work with code as well. So I always found it really hard to just, you know, write tests from the first minute essentially, right? This is what test-driven development assumes. You just sit and write tests first and then start writing code that makes those tests pass. I could never do that. Even when I had the exact specs, I could still never do that because uh, like he, he uses the word play here, which I think is very correct. I typically also draft very shitty code and play with it around to figure out what exactly it should do. And once I know that, okay, this is the functionality that should be there, I start describing it with tests saying, okay, so this should pass and this should pass and this integration test should pass and this is how it should behave, right? This is why I always felt weird about test-driven development. Maybe this is due to the R&D nature of the projects that I typically did, uh, because I know, you know, if you're working in enterprise and if you have a very strictly defined spec, then you probably can do TDD from the very beginning. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty uh, good way of putting essentially uh, the way I feel into the words as well. Okay. Now we are into the releases section. The first release of the Vic is XO version 0.24, and it uh, finally adds the support for parsing AS 2019, and as well some you know um, additional minor things like dropping support for Babel 6 and a bunch of other rules. If you never heard about XO, it's a really cool, um, essentially pre-configured linter that you just install and use uh, based on ESLint and uh, with existing configs, so sort of the idea is zero configuration, right? Um, but yeah, so check it out, it's quite nice. And there's a new release right now, which makes it even better. Next release we got here is the React DevTools version 3.6. Unfortunately, there are no release notes anywhere, or at least I couldn't find them. Uh, but there you go. So there's a Twitter tweet from one of the developers uh, and the DevTools version 3.6 adds React Hooks support, which means we are getting this close to React Hooks releasing. At least this is my guess, uh, so don't take my word for it, but I am guessing uh, we're gonna see the release probably by the end of January, maybe? I mean, if we're super lucky, you know, maybe, maybe in February, I don't know. But yeah, uh, this is very exciting and you can literally see, ah, what are you doing, browser? You can literally see hooks in the, um, dev tools and inspect them and work with them, which is kind of awesome. So yeah, there you go. Next release we got is NPM 660, which basically does a lot of refactoring out the legacy code, which was uh, slowing things down and, you know, being annoying. So um, yeah, and uh, adds a bunch of um, features like uh, NPM disk tags, uh, alias to this tags ls, which was slightly annoying sometimes to do, and uh, add support for IBM i. I'm not even sure what the hell is that. And um, it added support for the new NPM profile APIs, which was around, I think, for quite a while, but wasn't supported by NPM uh, CLI itself. So quite neat. All right, next release we got here is Node version 11.7. .7. This is the current version of Node which is uh, likely not you, not something you want to use in production if you want, you know, 100% stable stuff. Although I never had problems with running my demos on the latest nodes, you know. So it adds uh, broadly support that we talked about last time. It's had inspection options, uh, access private keys as public keys. Um, oh, sorry, always accept private keys as public keys in crypto. And then up updates the NPM to 6.5. And there's a bunch of other minor changes, so uh, do check it out. Uh, the 
notable change, I guess the most notable one for this release, aside from the Brotley, is that the workers are now exposed by default and you no longer need experimental worker flag for uh, workers to work, which is kind of great. And I think we're gonna use it for the BXJS website during the next dev stream. Next release we got here, and I think this is the last one, is ESM version 3.1.0, which um, is, yeah, adds support for quite a lot of things and uh, improves and fixes a bunch of other stuff. If you've never heard about the ESM, it's uh, ECMAScript module loader for Node.js, which makes it very easy to uh, import and export stuff in your node right now without any configuration, essentially. So if you never use it, try it out, it's really great. Yes, indeed, Worker is no longer experimental. It is awesome. All right, that is it for releases. Now we are getting into the libraries and demos section. The first library of today is the getClass.react, another library that allows you to like declaratively compose. Oh, no, that's not declare. That's uh, functionally, all right? <laughs> it's a functionally compose class names uh, from objects, strings, arrays, whatever the hell you want. Uh, we already talked like we had like four or five of them already on this podcast, but uh, maybe you still haven't picked one. So, you know, check this one out. Looks okay. Next thing we got here is ReadyMade, JavaScript micro library for developing web components with decorators. This actually looks really cool. So it allows you to create uh, web components, but instead of, you know, writing all that typical web components code that might be very annoying, like I tried building web components a few years ago and it wasn't very nice. And I think the spec didn't really change much. So this tool essentially allows you to do everything in one place using decorators, which looks pretty slick. So if you are building uh, web components, do check it out. This might simplify things a lot for you. Next uh, thing we got here is pinch zoom elements. This is a web component that enables pinch zooming DOM elements. So essentially if you want to allow user to pinch zoom just about anything, you just um, wrap this DOM with your pinch zoom uh, element and you're done, which is kind of awesome. So if you ever needed that, do check it out. Seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got here is Ala SQL, a JavaScript SQL database for browser and node handled both traditional relational tables, nest JSON data, no SQL, export store and import data from local storage, index DB and Excel. This is quite literally a, an uh, SQL database that is written in JavaScript and can be executed in memory in your browser or in Node.js. Um, it is great and um, the downside is because the SQL is a very complex thing, right? Uh, the downside is that it is actually something like 400 kilobytes, I think. Uh, we can actually check that. So we got LSQL, what is the install command? Uh, where, where is it? Uh, LSQL, there we go. So we need bundle phobia. I believe it was something like four for 500 uh, kilobytes. So like, you know, pretty large. Yeah, 432 kilobytes minified and 91.8 uh, kilobyte minified gzip. So it is definitely very big. But if you want to play with uh, MySQL in memory, or you want to use it for testing, for example, you can pretty much do that, which it, it seems to support majority of the uh, SQL 99 language, which is kind of awesome. So there you go. Next thing we got here is Velgo, a library to render your server side template using react like components. I honestly didn't quite understand why the hell would I need that, but um, maybe you do. So do check it out. It seems to be like another one of those server side rendering libraries. Um, mimicking react, but not for react. So I don't know, maybe you need that. <laughs> Okay, next thing we got here is Shiny, Shiny Reflections for mobile websites. This looks very fancy, let me show you. So if you watch this on the uh, desktop, you won't really see uh, anything, right? Because this, like, it needs, it, it uses the device motion. The cool thing is that um, iOS, oh, sorry, iOS, goddammit, Chrome can actually simulate it, right? So you can, so sensors, there's the sensors drawer, Right, and we can use the sensors drawer to override uh, orientation, right? And then you got this model that you can actually just drag and then you can see how it shines, which you see the text and the image shining and uh, this looks pretty slick actually. So <laughs> I don't know why would you want that, but if you need it in your website to make it a bit more shiny on mobiles, then uh, yeah, I guess yeah, grab it and use it. It seems to be quite nice. 
All right. Next thing we got here is nuclear popcorn time for music. I would call it Spotify and Torrents, but there you go. It's an open source project, so do check it out. Beware, you know, if your torrents are not permitted in your country, you are going to be downloading and sharing them. You might get a fine for that, or you might get a law enforcement coming to your house or something along those lines. So be careful with that stuff. Nonetheless, it's a very slick looking project. And um, yeah, it seems to integrate quite a bunch of APIs together. So it's a very nice code base to dive into. Uh, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Apollo Elements, which is a really neat idea, I think. The idea is that this is a custom element that you can connect to your Apollo GraphQL backends. Um, you literally create a new element, right? And you specify the client and you specify the query and the Apollo Elements essentially do everything for you, which is a really cool idea. Like this is where the GraphQL, I think, really starts shining when you can pull off things like this. And obviously because it's GraphQL, the components are generic, so you can use them in just about any uh, case where you have a GraphQL endpoint, right? Okay. Next thing we got here is for me, a tiny 532 byte library for handling form elements from a Mr. Luke Edwards, more tiny libraries from him. This one essentially yeah, just uh, working with forms, form validation uh, and stuff like this. If you ever needed something like this in, you know, outside of React or whatever, then do check it out. This seems to have just about everything you might want to want. Next thing we got here is the JSON to GraphQL from a JSON file to Postgres backed GraphQL in no time. Essentially allows you to write a JSON file and then uh, run the command line tool that basically converts the JSON file into the GraphQL API automatically, which is kind of awesome to be honest. So I would have to try that at one point because this seems to be absolutely fascinating. This tool is part of a larger tool called Hasura, which I also never heard about it before, which allows you to scaffold instant real-time GraphQL APIs on Postgres without any basically without almost no config, right? You just literally take the Docker container and start it and it just makes you an API. Then you can use the UI they provide in a browser to configure whatever the hell you want, which is kind of awesome. So yeah, do check it out. Seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got here is Nside, a JavaScript IDE for accessing a phone tablet native runtime via native script bindings. So you never heard about native script. It's a sort of JavaScript like, I guess, language that allows you to access native iOS and Android functionality uh, from JavaScript. Now, I thought it was a completely separate standalone framework, but it turns out you can actually take it and use it within the other apps, right? So they have here examples for Angular Vue. Um, I think there was a React example somewhere as well. And you can literally write like a view app and compile it down to the native view. So it's sort of like React Native, right? I thought it was basically like React Native, so you had to drag in the whole thing. But turns out you can just take native scripts, include it into your app, and then allow executing it dynamically. Like in this case, you can see rendering native views right on the phone, which is kind of crazy. So I I don't know if, if that is actually allowed to uh, this probably you cannot probably publish it on iOS because Apple doesn't really allow dynamic code execution in their store unless it's like JavaScript, I think. But yeah, it's ugh. they have some stupid rules, but uh, you probably can just install an Android and use it uh, locally. I don't know if that's if that's possible right now on iOS. I haven't built iOS apps for quite some time. Maybe you can now even build locally on iOS and run it on your phone just for yourself. So yeah, quite neat project. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is RxJS hooks, React hooks for RxJS. That ought to happen at some point and uh, there you go. That literally allows you to convert your observables into the React values using hooks. You can just, you know, wrap your observable into a use observable and you're basically done. You can use the value as normal value in your React app, which I imagine is a very simple hook actually, to be honest, but it is awesome that this exists basically. So 
yeah, if you're working with RxJS and React, do check this out. It seems like uh, the life of RxJS developer in React will become a lot easier in the future. So there you go. Last demo we got here is code to graph and it's a visualization tool that allows you to throw in just about any code you have in JavaScript and it will show you a graph of that code um, showing exactly what happens when the code is executed, which is kind of awesome. So if you're curious, uh, the code is also available on GitHub so you can uh, check out how it was made. That is actually it for the libraries and demos. We got a bit of a silly stuff left. So the first thing is a whoishorsejs.com project, which is aims to use data science to uncover the true identity of notorious JavaScript parody account. By the way, if you never followed horsejs, I would recommend checking it out. There is some uh, really funny things out there. But uh, yeah, so the couple of guys decided to try and figure out uh, using data science on who exactly wrote uh, or writes horsejs and they are doing some data analysis here and there's a write-up on what is going on and there's some conclusions on uh, you know what exactly is going on and uh, <laughs> there is yes privacy is paramount and whatever so i'm not going to press this button but if you're curious do check it out it's a really cool website and a really nice write-up uh, very amusing to read there's also a bunch of things actually that my javascript blocker uh, removed from this so you know be sure to uh, check it out like with your full graphics basically that's what i'm saying next thing we got here is javascript 10 year challenge uh, that actually blew my mind so in 2009 we only had javascripts now we have this incredible thriving ecosystem of amazing tools that make your life easier just about every day and when i started thinking about the you know 2009 2008 I remember that I used to absolutely hate JavaScript at a time and didn't want even touching it. It was terrible, abysmal and painful um, at a time. And now it is the possibly my most favorite language. Like I don't think I have anything that I like more than JavaScript right now. And uh, yeah, it is incredible how far it has progressed in just 10 years. So here's to 10 more years of awesome stuff. Next article we got here is the curious case of Raspberry Pi in the network closet. Um, it's a really cool story about the people who found Raspberry Pi uh, hooked into their closet with their servers and then they uh, reverse engineered the whole thing and found the person's home address from the Raspberry Pi and the data that was stored on it, which is absolutely fascinating to read. So do check it out. It is very cool. Uh, next article we got here is the Zelda Twilight Princess on Nvidia Shield received impressive graphical update through deep learning. This is, so I saw the, uh, I think it was publication from the Nvidia research team that showed off uh, how they use the deep learning to enhance or rather rebuild the textures, resize them to a higher definition, right? Now what they did is they took the games that were available for Nvidia Shield and integrated this deep learning technology, as far as I understood, right into NVIDIA Shield itself. So the game is not changed, but the uh, SDK itself rescales the textures to make them look better. And the examples they have here are freaking incredible. Like there is, um, there's comparison with the remasters made by humans, right? And, um, deep learning image so this is the original image which looks you know there's um very blurry textures and everything but it was released like ages ago there is the automatically rescaled image with deep learning it looks very sharp and nice and then there's the human rescaled image which was you know made uh, as hd remaster i think it looks actually worse than the deep learning version to be honest the fact that this is a thing makes me extremely happy for all the remasters and all the reworks. And I'm really curious um, if there's going to be any crazy people who would just go into the emulation scene, right? Take the PS3 emulator, uh, VU emulator, like the Dolphin, and add a deep learning approach to actually enhance the games in there. I'm curious also if we're going to see this sort of you know texture improvement uh, via deep learning working in real time in like five to ten years because of the you know simply the power of uh, gpus growing that would be very cool 
All right, and the last thing I got to show you here is the video called Let Me Ruin Counter-Strike Go Black Side for You. And uh, it, it, it is a video about Counter-Strike Black Side, which is the Counter-Strike Battle Royale mode that they launched recently. But it's a very technical video. It actually is 15 minutes or 14 and a half minutes of talking about the Counter-Strike Go engine, the source engine, right? And how exactly it um, works around all the, all of the engine limitations to kind of try and make a viable um, battle royale game, which should be sort of big and open, right? And uh, it is absolutely fascinating to what extents the developers have to go to retrofit the very old engine that is not supposed to work on open worlds into a larger map that is kind of has to be kind of open world. It is really, really cool and very interesting to watch. So if you are curious um, about the game dev, if you're interested in, you know, sort of how, uh, maybe if you, even if not, you know, just start in the background, just listen to the tr tricks that they use to make it work. It is absolutely fascinating. Right, that is it from my side, actually. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If you think I missed something, uh, if you have your own projects to share, throw them into the chat as well. If not, then we can wrap this up right here and go have a rest of the awesome rest of the weekend. As usual, you can find all the links mentioned in the description on the GitHub and uh, the link is in the description of the channel or the video or the podcast you're listening or whatever. Um, more than happy to uh, get any links from you guys. If you know, you know, just share them with me. Uh, we also have a Discord server that you can join and talk to us. Um, there is a lot of people there and we love talking about JavaScript and video games. Um, yeah, this is basically it from my side. Doesn't seem like anyone have any more questions, so I guess we can wrap it up over here. This was BXGS Weekly, episode 46. Thank you guys very much for watching. I wish you an awesome weekend and a great rest of the week. I see you Wednesday for the development live stream, and I see you next Saturday for more news. Uh, have an awesome day. Bye.